Hello, this is Ma'am Florence and I am with you for this video lesson on the subtopic sexual reproduction in plants. Okay, so I'll be with you throughout this video lecture. Let us begin. Okay, let's start off by answering the question, what is reproduction? Reproduction is the biological process by which organisms give birth or give rise to a new organism. This process is seen in all living organisms, both plants and animals, like you and me, your pets, and even the wild animals that live in this planet. Now, let us consider the plants first. For plant reproduction, we have sexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, we have the term angiosperm. This means a plant that produces seeds within an enclosure. In other words, a fruiting plant. The term angiosperm comes from the Greek composite word angion, which means case or casing, and sperma, which means seed. Technically, it means enclosed seeds after the enclosed condition of the seeds. And so, in sexual reproduction, flowers are very important. Angiosperms are flowering plants. It is because the flowers are their reproductive organs. Also, diploid sporophyte generation produces haploid gametophyte generation. This is what we call the alternation of generations. We have different gametes that are needed for sexual reproduction. The male gametophyte, which is also called the pollen grains, are developed from microspores, and the female gametophyte, which is our embryo sac, is developed from the megaspore. You'll be seeing a more detailed view of this on our next slide. To understand this better, let us first familiarize ourselves with the parts of a flower. So for this, I have a picture for you to understand this better. Can you guess what flower this is? I bet most of you have this in your homes. This flower is the gumamella flower or the hibiscus. So this flower is considered as the perfect flower because it has both the male and female parts in a single flower. Let's start with the first part, the sepal. It is the green, leaf-like structure protecting the bud as the flower develops. And from the picture, you cannot see the word sepal in it because the collective terms of the sepal are called calyx. So that's here at the bottom part of the flower, the green one, calyx. Next up, we have the petal. Petals are usually the brightly colored parts of the flower. We have different colors of petals uh, seen all over the world. And for this example, the petals are in pink. They are in bright colors to attract pollinators. And collectively, petals are called corolla. Next, let's go to the male and female parts of the flower. For the male organ, it is called the stamen, the collective term. And in the stamen, we can find long filamentous structure. The bulging tip of that is called the anther. And in the anther, we can find our pollen grains. Also, the long filamentous structure is called the filament. Okay? And then for the female organ, collective term is pistil. The pistil is a vase-like shaped structure which contains the bulging ovary, commonly found at the bottom part. Also, the slender stalk, which is our style. And the stigma, which has a sticky tip found up top. Okay, now that we are familiar with the different parts of the flower, they are also different variations of plants based on their flowers. Uh, the previous example that I showed you, the gumamella flower, 
it is considered as a hermaphrodite because both the male and female parts are seen in the same within the same flower. But we also have the monoecious plant, uh, which means that the same plant, it's the same plant with different flowers. So in this example, you will see in the same plant, we have our male flower and we have the female flower. Uh, examples of monoecious plants include the corn, squash, and pine. We also have the dioecious plant, which technically means that we have separate plants, the female plant and the male plant. Examples include the papaya, asparagus, and spinach. Okay, now let's go to the stages of sexual reproduction in plants. We have four stages and we'll go through each one. Number one is pollen and egg formation. Number two is pollination. Three, fertilization. And lastly, seed dispersal and germination. The first step is quite complex pollen and egg formation how does a plant make its own pollen okay so let's look at this picture over here now uh i need you to recall our anther it's part of our stamen right the bulging tip so in the anther we can find uh, small cells in there uh, specifically the microsporocyte so the microsporocyte is a diploid cell. So it has two N. These cells will undergo cell division, uh, specifically meiosis, to form microspores. So these microspores are haploid cells. So that's N. We have one, two, three, four. So these microspores will undergo mitosis. To then form our microgametophyte. So this microgametophyte is our pollen grain. And inside our pollen grain, there are two cells. We have our generative cell and our vegetative or tube cell. I will explain in the later parts what's the purpose of those cells. But anyway, that's how pollen are formed. Okay, now let's go to the egg cells. For this, we need to imagine our uh, pistil, the male organ. And we have here in the picture the wall of our ovary. And inside, we can find our embryo sac, the megaspore. Note that the egg cells come from the megaspore. The megaspore is our mother cell. It is a diploid cell, so that's 2N. This mother cell will undergo cell division, specifically meiosis, to form four haploid cells. Out of the four haploid cells, three of those will degenerate. So we are just left with a single embryo sac, which is a haploid cell, so that's N. Now this embryo sac will undergo mitosis three times. And the ending... We now have the embryo sac with eight haploid nuclei, some polar nuclei, and the egg cell. If we only show the gametes, this is what we see. The polar nuclei N and our egg cells. So those uh, are the different steps on how the pollen and the egg are formed inside our flowers. So I'm pretty sure you're familiar with pollen. Pollens can be used as supplements like this one in this sample. 100% pure bee pollen granules. Some of them consider this as beneficial to their health. Like this one in the form of a dietary supplement. But for other people, it can cause them hay fever and allergies. So some people are allergic with pollen. So they can't really smell flowers because they get all uh, irritated. But anyway, uh, the second step is called pollination. Pollination now involves the transfer of the pollen grains from the stamen, the male part, to the stigma, the sticky tip 
you remember. There are uh, two types of pollination. It can be self-pollination or cross-pollination. Now, the keyword for this, if we say self-pollination, it's within the same plant. For example, the anther of a flower will pollinate uh, the, the ovary of the same flower. But for cross-pollination, it involves a different plant, but still within the same species. Okay, now for the job to be done, we have different agents involved, like the wind, for example, to transfer the pollen grains. And we also have the water, which is also good in doing its job. And of course, animals like the bee that you, uh, that was shown to you on the previous slide. Okay, pollination. Now, just imagine, what if the pollen is already transported? It's already there uh, to the stigma. What's the next step? We have fertilization. Now, this is the union of the sperm cell and the egg cell. Okay, so the first step here, we have our pollen grain. It's already attached to the stigma. The pollen grain adheres to the stigma which contains two cells. You remember the two cells? We have our generative cell and a tube cell. This is a very unique way of transporting. The tube cell, that one cell, uh, it will grow into the style. So it's like burrowing deep inside our style, the slender stalk. Then the generative cell travels inside the pollen tube. It will divide to form two sperm as you can see there so they're now traveling there and then the pollen tube penetrates an opening in the ovule called a micropyle so it's already open it will penetrate inside and then here a closer look one of the sperm cell fertilizes the egg to form the diploid zygote and then the other one the other sperm fertilizes two polar nuclei to form the triploid endosperm, which will become a food source for the, ingro for the growing embryo. Okay, so out of the two sperms, only one will continue to become our uh, zygote, and the other one, it will nourish that zygote. Alright, so that is fertilization. And then, on to the fourth step, seed dispersal and germination. So that zygote will eventually form the seed. Okay, so those seeds will need to be dispersed so they can grow in different locations. And then grow to become a mature plant. Okay, so for seed dispersal, we have then a lot of agents to do the job. Like for example, in dandelion, the wind is an agent for seed dispersal. You can see in the GIF, it's blown away. And for uh, the case of acorn in coconuts, the water is a good agent. So if you think about it, you can find a lot of coconut trees near coastal areas, right? Because water is a way of them, a uh, way of their seeds to be dispersed. And then for animals, uh, they help also, like the birds and bats. Okay, and uh, for peas, a very unique way they explode to disperse their seeds. So that's how uh, seeds are dispersed in different areas. And then after the seeds are then disposed, I mean dispersed, sorry, in different areas, those seeds will need to germinate to at least show uh, the primary signs of life that it's ready to grow now as a plant. So, germination will happen under optimal conditions. Uh, good water source, uh, presence of different gases and nutrients. It will start with plant embryo, the root stem portion, and one or more cotyledons. Cotyledons are considered as the first leaves of the plant. And here in the picture, you will see our cotyledon or the seed coat. It will turn green because uh, they will photosynthesize to produce sugars or food for the growing plant. And then, the plant will continue to draw resources from the first leaves, the cotyledon. And then, uh, it will grow and show its first two leaves. Just like uh, in the JF here, you see, the leaves are growing out of the cotyledons. 
So then, uh, those cotyledons will, if the leaves are already mature and it it can already do the job, the cotyledons will wither, and then the plant will continue to grow. All right. So those are the four steps in the sexual reproduction in plants. Okay, so I hope you got that. Uh, if there are some parts that are confusing for you, you can just go back to the video, watch it, and just uh, get the idea. If you're still confused, you can ask your teacher about this. But that's it for the first part. Thank you!